Hello everyone, this is just a short recap video then of water and carbon. Um, water and carbon is obviously out of 36 marks on the exam. You've got a 4, two six markers and a 20. Um, quite useful, I think, to spend quite a bit of time going through this one and just making sure that you understand some of the processes, um, which is all this video is going to do. So if you're starting water and carbon then, it's important you understand what a systems approach is. If you're using a system approach or a system, then you can say, well, right, this is a set of interrelated components that sort of form a working unit. So a bit like the diagram is showing you here, you've got lots of different cogs that are all working together. That's what we're sort of getting out or hinting at if we're talking about a systems approach. And so to go with that then, you've got sort of several key components. So you've got things like flows, inputs, stores, components, matter and output. And all the definitions for those there anyway are shown on the screen. But again, using words like this are really sort of fundamental to helping explain what's going on in the water and carbon cycle, and perhaps linking the two together as well. So within this then, you can sort of say you've got three systems and you can see the pictures and the definitions here anyway. But if you're operating an open system, that means your energy and matter can be transferred into the surrounding environment as the picture shows. So if you're in an open system, there are inputs and outputs of both energy then and matter. If you're in a closed system, the energy is transferred into and beyond the system, but matter is not. So matter can only be cycled between the stores. So energy does have inputs and outputs therefore from the system. And an isolated system, therefore, must mean there are no interactions with anything outside of the system boundary. So like a lab experiment, we wouldn't typically find an isolated system within nature. So if we think about how we apply those systems then to sort of real life examples, we might say, well, the drainage basin, and I'll highlight it to make it really clear, is an example then of an open system. We know this to be an example of an open system because we're getting energy from the sun and that energy from the sun can enter and leave the system. We have water and that water is an input and we get that input from things like precipitation and it leaves that system, so it's outputted as river discharge. Remember, discharge is just volume of water that you've got and that discharge therefore goes into the sea we think about a carbon cycle. A carbon cycle is a closed system. So we have energy, yes, but energy is more of an input. So that comes from the sun by methods like photosynthesis. And that output then comes in the form of respiration. But the amount of carbon on Earth then stays the same. Okay, and it's staying the same because there are no inputs or outputs of matter in this case. So to follow on from that then, there are sort of another three key terms that you might find quite useful to recap. So you have something called dynamic equilibrium. So that's just when you've got your inputs and outputs in the system and they're in balance, i.e. the same. Positive feedback. So positive feedback is just the effects of an action. And they get amplified or multiplied then by those knock-on effects. And we'll talk about what that means in a second. Negative feedback then would obviously be the opposite. OK, if you look at the blue writing at the bottom, what I've done again is just sort of simplify it and pop it all together. So feel free to pause at this point if you need to. So if we look at what this sort of looks like in practice, as we said already, well, our positive feedback here is going to exacerbate the change. OK, it's going to create a new equilibrium and you can see that there in the diagram. Again, it's gone through and I've highlighted on when there's positive feedback. Negative, the opposite, well, it's nullifying the change. It's trying to restore that equilibrium. Okay, and again, you can see I've highlighted that on them in the green on these diagrams. Again, these diagrams are just nice recaps of things I'm sure we've talked about in class anyway. But if you need to pause, please do. So if we sort of link this together then within another example here. You can see that we've linked together the hydrosphere, atmosphere, you've got your lithosphere and your biosphere as well. Okay, if you look at sort of the blue text and the blue writing here, 
we've sort of started to put on exactly what those things mean in sort of simple words or simple language to help break that down. But in short here, what we're saying is, right, the hydrosphere then is going to include all water liquid. OK, that can be solid and gas as well. Typically salt and fresh water too. Your air and your atmosphere then is that layer of gas, obviously. Your biosphere, part of the earth where we've got our living things. And last but not least, then your lithosphere, which is your outermost part of the crust. OK, and all this diagram here is doing is linking the two together and showing the interactions you've got then between each one. So to sort of sum up then everything we've talked about so far, your definitions are back on the screen again. So if you didn't get them last time, perhaps now is a chance to do that one. But most importantly, what's been added in here for you is like the real life examples, if you like, of where you would see each of those things. OK, well, in the exam, you might be asked for a couple of marks, perhaps a four marker to outline what these might look like or perhaps to describe a couple of these. So this is worthwhile taking the time to note and taking the time to recap. Again, if you need to pause it, please do. So if we move on from here then and start to think about the global distribution and the size and the major stores in water, I think this diagram here is pretty important. OK, so sort of current sort of size of stores, we've got about 3% of fresh water, 70% of it's frozen, 1% of it is surface water. We're getting 50% of water from lakes, 40% we can know comes from soil and 10% from that other. OK. So the location of water, then we can sort of split into four spheres. OK, so your lithosphere, your hydrosphere and your cryosphere and your atmosphere. Okay, and that's what this is showing us here, is how we can break down those different stores even further beyond some of the headings that we've used already. So if we start now to sort of think about process and sort of water processes and what we've got happening here. We start first and foremost, and perhaps most obviously then, with evaporation. Okay, so evaporation, we obviously know, occurs when water changes from liquid to a gas. Here, all it's doing is increasing the amount of water that we've got stored in the atmosphere. For high rates, then, of evaporation, and when they're high, it's typically dependent on those four bullet points that you can see there. So if we've got higher levels of solar radiation, well, heat is breaking the bonds between those molecules. High temperatures, so we know warmer typically holds more moisture. We've obviously got to have a large supply of water if it's going to increase and dry air. So if evaporation exceeds condensation, as it says, the air becomes saturated. If the air is saturated, it just means it can't hold any more water. So relative humidity has to be about 100%. Therefore, we can link this a little bit to transpiration, and evapotranspiration obviously comes when you put the two together. But as a reminder then, transpiration is the process by which moisture is lost, okay, for those small poles that are on the leaves. Again, you might find it quite useful if you're annotating or making a mind map at this point to add this to your diagram. This is often one of the processes that's forgotten, hence it's got its own slide. So we can link then evaporation and transpiration to some extent to cloud formation, okay, in particular condensation as well. If we're getting condensation, we know the dew point's being reached. So the temperature where vapour becomes liquid, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the dew point. So air rises, it's going to cool, of course, it's going to condense them, and clouds are going to form as well. Remember, you've got your two different types of precipitation. So you've got your frontal precipitation, but also your convectional precipitation as well. Again, really, really worth recapping these. And perhaps as well, having a little look at what we mean by relief precipitation, if you've forgotten. I know we covered that one in year seven, so I don't want to spend too much time dwelling on that one. So before we talk a bit more about this precipitation then, let's just recap very briefly your cloud formation. So if we're getting clouds forming, insulation is going to obviously provide that heat energy. We're talking about heat energy. That heat energy is coming from our wonderful sun then. So the Earth's surface is likely to be heated, but obviously that heat is going to be unequal. It's not concentrated. So then what's going to happen is that hot air is going to start to rise. We're obviously going to get some cooling as well. As this cooling starts to happen, we know it's going to begin to expand. We've got lower pressure. That's what's causing it to cool down. 
Therefore, what we're going to start to see then is the thermal is going to continue to rise until it reaches that saturation point that we were talking about. If we're at saturation point then, this is when our condensation starts to occur. So that's how we get to our dew point. At this point, we know relative humidity is now going to be about 100%. And that's when we're going to start to get our cloud. Again, if you need to pause on this diagram to recap it or rewind that little bit to hear me explain it again, that would be a really good opportunity. So this leads us quite nicely then on to sublimation. So I've popped the two definitions on here, but if we're talking about sublimation, we're talking about our direct change of state then. So i.e. we're talking about solid to gas, perhaps emitting then the liquid stage. So desimation then is obviously a direct change from a gas to a solid emitting the liquid stage. So perhaps the formation of ice then from water vapour, for example. Again, you can see I've popped on a diagram so you can see those processes in action there. So to recap then, this is obviously going to occur most readily when, well, it's going to happen when our humidity is relatively low. The air is dry, so obviously dry air is going to help this process to occur. Got to have some strong sunlight because that's providing the energy for this process. Again, you need your strong winds in area of low pressure. So some winds we know bring with them milder air. Okay, and it's also going to happen at higher altitudes. That's happening there because it's typically low pressure, but also because it gives it that cold temperature. Okay. You might be thinking, well, what's that high and low pressure and where's that happening? Well, that links back into your atmospheric circulation model. Okay, I'm sure you've talked about this lots anyway. But remember, your winds are always going to blow from high to low. Okay, that's one thing you can take as fact and learn. Think about the cells that you have around the outside as a reminder. So you've got your polar, your Hadley and also your feral cell. Okay, there it is. It's down in the middle on that one there. Again... Remember, you've also got your Coriolis force. So the idea that these winds aren't flowing straight, the winds are always curved or bent. So if we briefly just recap this one here. So for example, if I take the point where my polar cell is meeting my feral cell, what I'm seeing here is this warm air rising, cooling and condensing, because obviously I've got my clouds. That wind has got to blow from high to low, or it sinks back down then. This process starts all over again. That's it, just the most basic formations, just to quickly recap on this video. Obviously, if you need to watch this in more detail, come and see me. So, how does this all fit in then with our drainage basin? Okay, in terms like this, you've covered back at GCSE when you've thought about rivers and you've thought about the drainage basin, that area of land then that the river drains or that the river is found in. That's what we're talking about with our drainage basin. So, at A level, you've probably seen a diagram that looks quite a lot like this one here. Again, just to recap then some of these processes and some of the things we've got happening here and some new terms. So soil water, you can see here, slightly different from some of the things you've covered before. But here we've got water filling up the pores in the soil. Your groundwater, again, we'll talk about the key in a second, but that's stored in the pores of the rock. You've got your stem flow. I haven't labelled that one on, have I? But your stem flow sort of trickles down. Overland flow. Okay, remember overland flow is not surface runoff. So overland flow is when you've got your soil that's saturated or you've got rain that's too heavy. Through flow. That there. It's when that water moves downhill then, but it's moving through the soil. Note the layer that you've got there on the diagram to help you remember. And you've also got then your percolation. Okay, percolation, I'll circle it again on the diagram there. So it's moving into underground stores this time with the water. Okay, you may well wish to compare infiltration capacity. So you can compare that then perhaps to the rate of infiltration side by side if you wanted to. The colours on this diagram, so I popped a little key on it again to remind you and link it back to the key terms we talked about at the start. But obviously you've got your inputs. So in this case, you've got your input of precipitation, you've got stores, so you've got stores in interception, the groundwater, soil water, you've even got some surface storage as well. Flows, you've got lots of these, 
So your stem flow, your infiltration, your percolation, through flow, groundwater flow, and then obviously your outputs. So transpiration, evaporation, and ultimately channel flow as well. So this lovely little diagram here shows us what we call the water balance. I'll pop the title back on in case you've forgotten what this diagram shows you. So the water balance then tells you the long-term relationship between those inputs, outputs and stores in the basin. If I wanted to calculate the water balance, I would need that famous equation. So I'd need the equation that starts with P equals Q plus E and obviously plus S as well. And I'll put the S in brackets and I'll explain why that's there in a minute. So P in the case of this diagram equals precipitation. So I can put that on here. Q in the case of this diagram equals runoff or discharge. E is my evapotranspiration. Uh, that's that one on there, is it gonna fit? So if we go dot dot dot, you know what that means. And S is my storage change. Now I said we come back to that S a bit more, didn't I? Because that storage change could be positive or negative. Okay, so if I get a positive balance, it's typically wet. If I get a negative balance, it's typically dry. Okay, and that balance changes within the season. So in summer, for example, we've got people that are using water, we've got plants that grow more, they're using more of those stores. In the winter, we know it rains more, so surplus water is stored. Okay, and that links back in here then, doesn't it? So as it says to sort of sum up at the bottom here, the water balance affects how much water is stored then ultimately within the drainage basin. So from here, you can start to apply this a little bit onto your flood hydrograph or your storm hydrographs. Again, you'll start to see that I've added on some of the labels here, some of the things hopefully you're most familiar with. So you've got your lag time here. So it's your time taken between peak rainfall and peak discharge. Peak discharge just means when the volume of water is at its greatest. You've got your bank full discharge. So that's the point where it starts to overflow. I mean, again, that's going to vary that line there, dependent on the river. Your rising limb, so the point where this line starts to climb. So therefore, the opposite of that would be the receding limb, where this starts to recede or obviously sink down. The bars here are showing you your rainfall. So it's obviously happening during the event itself. And base flow. So this is the normal discharge of the river then. So all of these things together allow us to map on precipitation, but also the pattern of what that water is doing within the river. So it's important then to consider humans and humans impact then on the water cycle. And perhaps do we have good or bad effects? OK, so this bit here is most likely also to be an exam question. OK, we know perhaps within geography at the moment, incredibly dynamic we've got to sort of take accountability then haven't we for some of the actions so how can humans impact on this we're impacting on soil drainage so farming practices abstraction and also then deforestation so we can go through this a little bit now so that's soil damage then from farming practices well deforestation is going to result in increased erosion we've got more through flow this makes the soil dry, it's quite hard. Okay, if I sort out the soil drainage, well, that will help to increase through flow. If I think a little bit about abstraction, well, over abstraction can cause droughts. This affects the proportion of water in different spheres. So, human impacts are rarely undone by nature, so it's usually by further human involvement. And last but not least, then, Think about land use change and deforestation, or urbanisation, drains making permeable surfaces, which funnels water into the river. So sometimes we have problems with blockages. Deforestation also results in less transpiration, which ultimately then is going to give us drier air. So to finish this last little bit then, you have to have a case study of a river catchment at a local scale, as it says on the spec, to analyse the key themes.
those key themes are everything we've covered in this video up until now. So your case study of this then would obviously be the River Eden and its drainage basin. You've got some lovely little photos here that obviously show the football ground versus Storm Desmond back in 2015. This one here is perhaps the most important case study to stress to you because you've got to illustrate all of those key concepts and everything that you had going beforehand. So just to remind you, your characteristics then of the Eden Basin affect the water cycle. Okay, and these points here sort of help to sum up all of those things. But you've got rainfall higher than the national average in the Eden Basin, and that's because of the relief to remind you. High rainfall obviously is going to result in lots of water entering the channel through the drainage basin. The slopes, therefore, are incredibly steep because we've already talked about relief. Well, steep slopes we know is going to impact on lag time. It's also going to impact on discharge in the drainage basin. Geology here plays a huge role then in things like percolation as well. Highest ground is found in the west of the basin. It's got that igneous rock. It's impermeable. It won't soak up water. Much of this basin as well, whilst we continue to think about geology, is made of limestone, which is permeable. Okay, And in those areas, then, that's when we will see the quick infiltration. So I think perhaps what's most important here is to note that change between the west of the basin and the rest. This lovely little table, then, again, is starting to show you just what's happening. So each of the factors I've popped in here those are the ones from our sort of brief discussion on the previous slide. I've started to think again about how it affects flow and stores and how significant or important this is. Okay, You may well wish to rate these from one to five and say, right, how significant are each of these factors? This would really be quite beneficial in that 20 marker where you've got to evaluate and you've got to come to some sort of judgment. You might be asked to comment on which is the most significant factor. So learning this table and recapping this will help you quite a lot. Again, think about being critical in your 20 marker. Well, just how significant are these factors? How far do you agree? Which one of these is playing the biggest role then within that drainage basin? This whole table, I'll pop a link to below the video. You've also got this, I hope, within your notes. And if you haven't, go and see your geography teacher, please, to grab a copy of this one. It should also be on the case study card that you have. So now might be a good time to pause if you want to take a break, but I'm going to continue and I'm going to talk through then the carbon cycle side of things. So remember water and carbon split 50-50, isn't it, between both of those cycles. Within this side of the topic then, you've got to cover off pretty much the same sort of things that are in water. So again, you've got to start thinking about those categories again or spheres. We're going to start thinking about variations within this. Obviously you've got to think about human involvement. And we've got to start to think about mitigation efforts as well towards the end. So if we think about the carbon cycle, for example, where we're getting our carbon. OK, so we have a balance here between process, but also between reservoirs. That's what the different colours mean on this diagram here. Process is put in orange. So again, some of those things we can already see. So, for example, processes here it might be things like your decomposition, your burning of fossil fuels your diffusion, your reservoirs, in this case, might be things like your sedimentary rocks, your food webs, your ocean surface, for example, as well. So natural processes then can change or impact on the carbon cycle. So that first one we talked about just a second ago, if we go back to our diagram over here, we're starting to talk about them, the volcanic activity. So volcanic activity, we know, can alter the magnitude then of carbon stores. If we perhaps take wildfires as an example of natural hazard and how this impacts on it, well, wildfires are rapidly transferring quantities of carbon, and they're doing that because it's coming from the biomass or the soil to the atmosphere. So if I think about this long term, it's obviously going to encourage the growth of new plants, which take in that carbon then from the atmosphere. We know plants taking carbon from the atmosphere because they're using that as part of photosynthesis. So depending on obviously the amount and the type of regrowth, perhaps wildfires here might be able to create almost a neutral effect. Again, I also know that humans impact on the carbon cycle and that natural and human balance is something, again, you might be asked to comment on in the exam. 
we know that the industrial revolution then has been adding to the carbon cycle hugely okay it's been happening much faster than it would occur naturally so perhaps that's a critique you could use in the exam if you take your hydrocarbons for example and their extraction use so think fossil fuels in really simple words well we know we've been burning far more and far greater quantities of these then without human use then that fuel would obviously have stayed sequestered so stored in the lithosphere for thousands or million years but the fact is we're using it deforestation here is also adding to this so we've got clearing of forests perhaps for agriculture or logging as an idea here Again, that's going to obviously reduce the size of that carbon store. And if the cleared forest then is burned, we've obviously got a rapid flow of carbon. And that carbon will be moving from the biosphere to the atmosphere, as we talked about those stores before. Again, to continue thinking about humans. So here you've got even more to evaluate, haven't you? Perhaps there's a bit of an imbalance here between natural and human. Those farming practices. We've got animals releasing CO2. We've got the use of machinery again, releasing CO2. We know that mechanisation is something that's going to continue to increase as we continue to become even more globalised. So the world population now is rising so dramatically that food production and our practices have got to match that. So we are going to continue to release even more CO2 and even more methane if we're continuing the diet and the lifestyle that we're all really accustomed to. Land use changes then. So you might want to start to link this with some of your contemporary urban environments knowledge as well. So if you've got the change of natural or agricultural land to urban land, again, that creates huge challenges. You're removing vegetation to make way for buildings. You've got lots of concrete production. Again, concrete production here is going to release a lot of CO2. Again, you've got lots of concrete, obviously, when urban areas expand. Urban sprawl, a huge process here that impacts on the carbon cycle. So the presence of carbon in the world isn't necessarily a negative thing it's useful for both the land the ocean the atmosphere and this table that you can see here sort of sums it up okay we're not all saying well this is all doom and gloom because we know there's a really healthy balance that healthy balance here is what's helped the planet to thrive and sort of survive for many millions of years before we even sort of cottoned on to this again this table here in the land column for example is saying right carbon stored in grass provides that fodder for animals it's food it's a natural resource that our planet is benefiting from. In the ocean, it's being converted into calcium carbonate. Again, that's being used then by organisms to build shells. It's helping to develop their habitats. If we think within the atmosphere, well, it's helping to warm the earth through the greenhouse effect, perhaps the most obvious one. If we didn't have the greenhouse effect, well, we wouldn't have life on earth. So the carbon budget then is where this sort of all links in and all fits together. So the carbon budget is the difference between the inputs of the carbon then into a subsistence and the outputs of carbon from it. OK, so if we think about the carbon cycle, then we're saying, right, in short, it's the constant movement, then, isn't it, from carbon from one store to another. So if you're thinking about the carbon store, it often means then it's got to change state. OK, so if we start to think about this a little bit more, or your store then, is either going to be classed as a sink or a source. If I've got a carbon sink, I've got to think about that balance and haven't I between my inputs and my outputs. Okay. Think about your less than and greater than and which way round that's going to go. Likewise, if you're thinking about a source as well. So to help you with that, I've written out, haven't I? I've said a carbon source then releases more carbon than it can absorb. A carbon sink absorbs more carbon than it releases. Again, really important that you get those two there the right way round. So again, if you need to pause it to recap this, please do. So if we think about our inputs and our outputs then from the atmosphere, well, big inputs here are coming from your volcanic eruptions, your fossil fuels, your decomposition. Your outputs here would be in the form of things like sequestration, photosynthesis, ocean uptake, chemical weathering. So to sum up then everything we've just spoken about, water and carbon stores then are essential for life. Okay, so we know that water is present in the atmosphere as water vapour, droplets. We know that carbon exists as methane and carbon dioxide. So greenhouse gases are creating this natural greenhouse effect. So this is preventing some energy obviously from escaping to space and reflects it back into Earth. So in short to say really, if we didn't have this natural greenhouse effect, 
the earth would be frozen. We know it would be uninhabitable. It would be at minus 18 degrees. So we're saying a healthy balance here between the two is actually quite beneficial. We think about the human enhanced greenhouse effect. Well, we know, again, there's loads and loads of shows anyway at the moment out about it. But human activities there are causing that increase in greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So this is reflecting more energy back then to the Earth. That's the bit there that's creating that global warming. So feedback cycles then, and we're nearly at the end for those of you that are still hanging in there. Feedback cycles, we're just saying, right, these are the effects of a change on a system. So we're talking about are they being amplified by positive feedback or are they being dampened then by negative feedback? Okay. Again, I've put here, you might want to copy the positive feedback in the water cycle. So you've got an example of what this looks like. If you want to sort of pause at this point, what I've done here is start to put the statements in. Then obviously for negative here, if you'd like to have a go at arranging those yourself, just to check your understanding. So if I'm talking about the positive cycle, then I'm saying the amount of water then in the atmosphere is going to increase. Therefore, the greenhouse gas increases, temperatures are going to rise, evaporation increases, and this sort of cycle again, it's all interlinked, it's going to repeat. If you want to pause again to go at negative, please do, but I'm going to continue. So if I think about the negative one here, then I've got temperature rise, going to evaporation increasing, the amount of water vapour in the atmosphere is going to increase, increase cloud cover, so therefore my temperature in this case is going to fall. Again, pause here if you'd like to take that one down as an example. So, again, again, let's come back to positive feedback in the carbon cycle. So, to recap, it's very different from the diagram that we just looked at. So, we've said CO2 increases, greenhouse effect increases, we've got temperature rise, and plant respiration rate increases. Okay. Just double check and go back to your previous diagrams here. That's quite different, isn't it? We're talking about the impacts here with the water. Go back, well, how is that different? We've got that huge impact then on plant respiration rate as part of the positive feedback in the carbon cycle. What does negative feedback then with the carbon cycle look like? Well, my CO2 in the atmosphere is going to increase. I've got extra CO2 here causing plants to increase in growth. Plants are going to remove and store the CO2 from the atmosphere. The amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, therefore, is going to reduce. So that's what my negative feedback in the carbon cycle would look like. Again, feel free to pause this. You can go back and you can compare it, perhaps, to the negative feedback in the water cycle, if you'd like to put those both side by side. So we might want to start thinking about these strategies then. We might want to start saying, right, what can we actually do here to have some sort of impact? Okay, so we can again take this across a variety of scales. With geographers, we love talking about scale. Scale also, remember, is something you can comment on quite a lot, especially within your 20 markers. If I think about an individual scale on the individual level, what can we do locally perhaps to try and have some sort of impact on both of these? Well, individuals perhaps could use their cars less. We could look at perhaps being more energy efficient. I think nationally, I can try and reduce the reliance on fossil fuels, more sustainable development, perhaps even some carbon capture. And globally then, this is when your international treaties come into play. Again, super important, you know, the differences between those. I can think about mitigation, and there's lots of different types of mitigation. You can see those here. Again, feel free to pause if I'm going too quickly and you need to take this down. So we've talked briefly already, haven't we, about carbon capture and storage. That's collecting that carbon dioxide then from emissions and trapping it underground or within water. The big one with this is it's quite expensive. We don't really know what the environmental impacts of this is. It's not always a viable option. You've got your plantation forests. We know that forests are acting as a sink. Okay, so we might say, right, this is pretty good. It's removing the stored carbon. It's allowing more to be captured. But this is limited. It takes up a huge amount of space. It lacks the biodiversity, obviously, of a natural forest. We can change the land use. So perhaps we might want to talk about carbon farming here. We don't want to replace crops. We might want to only buy FSC wood and tree products. Again, your Kyoto Protocol here and your Clean Development Mechanism comes into play. We'll talk about what that means in just a second. 
improving grasslands. Again, why is that particularly beneficial? Well, it's hopefully going to help with less soil erosion. We know that grass pulls CO2 into the soil. We might want to talk about aviation and the advancements there. So perhaps taking fuel efficient routes. We might want to match aircraft to the route, ensure all seats are occupied. What you'd hope would all be common sense things there. So we think more then about these international agreements. These big ones then that I suggest you sort of know or recap and have a little think about. So the big one in 2005 was the Kyoto Protocol. Okay, this is the one that's linked heavily with the UN. Okay, they've got three sort of big mechanisms behind this agreement. Okay, um, the three big mechanisms behind this is obviously your emissions trading, your clean development that we just spoke about, and the joint implementation. Joint implementation basically says, well, countries have got a cap on their emissions to try and reduce it and try and bring it down. Clean development says, well, countries can earn their emissions if they do something about it and implement some sort of project. And the international emissions is basically saying, here's a set quota and you can trade this with other countries if you need to, but that's almost your allowance, your limit. So in terms of evaluating this protocol, generally, it's a success. Okay, it's a legally binding contract. You could also argue this one here makes people a little bit more accountable or countries more accountable rather. So in 2009, you've also got your Copenhagen Accord. Again, this was more about setting individual emission reduction targets for each country. It was more bespoke. It was more personalised. However, it lacks sort of that legal binding of the previous Kyoto Protocol. Okay, it didn't cap developing countries where perhaps those emissions are the highest. And your 2015 then Paris Agreement went about to say, right, we've got to keep global temperature increase to a minimum. In fact, two degrees above pre-industrial. We've got to try and work against the impacts of climate change. We've got to also help with suitable amounts of aid. It's got to be realistic. Um, in terms of the evaluation, you can see what I've added in here anyway. But it says, well, this was the first agreement to unite all countries. It did cause conflict then between developed and developing. Okay, Some countries felt they were sort of almost damaged by this, and South Africa was definitely one. Okay, Many richer countries felt this put their nations at a disadvantage, and they felt almost there was big disparities, almost one rule for one, another for another, if you like. So if we move on then, think about your big case study here of the carbon cycle bit like we did for water. You're obviously going to be talking about the Amazon rainforest. These points here sort of help to set some of the scene for that. But again, your Amazon rainforest, you've got 300 billion trees, 15,000 species, 20% then of the world's biomass or carbon. It's all exciting stuff. If you think about carbon, you've got 80 to 100 billion tonnes there then as well. These are big facts today, aren't they? <laughs> and compare that with water then, you've got 175,000 cubic discharge per day. So 15% of all fresh water entering the oceans. There's some nice background facts that you can use in things like introductions. Again, pause that if you want more, but I think those facts there are pretty much enough. You've got huge drivers of change then, obviously, within the Amazon rainforest. If you think about the biggest challenge that they're facing at the moment, it's probably deforestation. They've also the fourth largest climate polluter, greenhouse gas emissions there, and land use change, particularly from urbanisation, again, are really impacting there. Evaporation forms of shallow clouds at the moment. They're not producing a lot of rain. You've got slash and burn techniques to add on top of that. Again, the deep roots from those trees, think about buttress roots, thinking about adaptation. They're getting 20 to 30% more humidity to the atmosphere, 5 to 20% more rainfall. Again, all of this is on your case study card anyway, but pause it if you need to. So if we think about how this is impacting on the following then, you can almost argue you've got impacts on three key areas here. So if we think about climate change, again, you can see the facts that are there. But that temperature increase is pretty staggering, isn't it? By 2050, two to three degree increase impacting. Again, you've got more frequent and more extremes in temperature, falling rainfall, perhaps I think to the clouds then, and the lack of clouds and size of clouds that we just spoke about. Vegetation change, again, huge rates of deforestation here, I mean massive impacts. And point number seven I think is particularly important, that 2009 study, two degree temperature rise above pre-industrial levels, 
We'll link that back. Paris Agreement was trying to keep that at that level, wasn't it? Okay, think about where we are today. It's highly likely that that's been exceeded. The soil then, where the upper 50 centimetres of soil has got between 4 and 9 grams of carbon in it. So pastures only have 1 kilogram, okay? Think about how much more this has already got in it before you even start. So last but not least then, you can link this back to your rivers and that drainage basin back where we started at the beginning of this video. And you can say, well, actually, the change in precipitation and seasonality and extreme rainfall then is starting to mean that river discharge is decreasing. We've got more silts. We've got flash flooding. Again, it's damaging those freshwater ecosystems and the water supply. Change in river biodiversity is happening then by some species introducing others. So we've got a bit of imbalance here between predator and prey. And the diagram you've got here is starting to think about, well, what can we actually do? What can we do to mitigate them against this environmental damage? Okay. And again, you can see some ideas here. You've got cooperation networks. Again, you've got the Amazon Treaty, which I think is particularly important. The creation of national parks biofuel production, reforestation, sometimes called afforestation. Again, you can try to introduce some of those native species back. So you might be asked to evaluate or come up with various strategies in the exam. You might be asked to discuss the mitigation attempts. You might be asked to evaluate which perhaps has been the most successful and why. So it might be a good idea to think about how you would rank order those as part of your revision. Which one are you going to justify to be the most influential? Or perhaps which one do you think has got the fundamentally the most flaws or the most failures? And again, you can do that with those agreements, can't you? And say, well, actually, which one of those had the most impact? Which one of those perhaps was rubbish, for want of a better word? Why do you think they're in that order? They could ask you that also, couldn't they, for a 20 mark question? So as I said, this video here was just going to give you a very brief overview of water and carbon cycles. But I hope it goes some way to help in your revision. If you've got questions, come and have a chat. Come and ask your geography teacher. Um, and I hopefully see you soon.